So I have a separate vid guide about pre-clearance of insider trades, what a sound compliance program looks like, a link to which is beneath this video. And one of my recommendations was to scare your insiders by providing them examples, regaling them with stories about how people that look like them get caught when they engage in illegal insider trading. So I did some extensive online searching to see if anyone had compiled these stories so that you could build a playbook from which you can draw upon from, for this exercise. And I found nothing, Zippo. So I've compiled some of these stories for you today on Zippy Point. I'm Brock Romanek and I'm a big fan of yous. So also let me mention another separate vid guide the link to which is below is about the type of sophisticated technology that the SEC and FINRA use to catch those that engage in insider trading. That video will also help scare your insiders by <laughs> revealing how easy it is to catch people that that engage in illegal insider trading. I mean, it's easy. It's, <laughs> there's an electronic trail to all this stuff. But this video covers the other thing, like I mentioned, the stories, the, 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 the message cases that the SEC's Enforcement Division brings over the years to scare people to act as a deterrent. And just a reminder that the SEC only has the authority to bring civil a uh, actions for insider trading violations. However, you can be brought up for criminal charges too. That's the Department of Justice that handles that. And the DOJ and the SEC often work together on the same case. The other thing to note is that the NYC and NASDAQ have surveillance obligations that they basically outsource to FINRA. And FINRA has a, a sophisticated piece of equipment called sonar that truly tracks a lot of the insider illegal insider trades, and they then refer the cases over to the SEC. So a few other notes before I dig in. The SEC's Enforcement Division brings between 30 to 60 insider trading cases per year, and then the Enforcement Division puts out an annual report, typically November, shortly after the agency's fiscal year end, which includes a chart listing how many cases it actually brought over the last year that were related to insider trading. So for 2019, there were 32 cases, which was a five was, which was 5% of the division's overall caseload, down from 50 the prior year. Uh, Cedar, insider trading cases historically have been about 10% of the SEC's caseload. I hazard to guess that there are many more instances of insider trading going out there. FINRA refers about 400 suspicious trades to the SEC per year, which I note in a separate vid guide about FINRA chronology letters. Uh, a link to that is beneath is below too, that if you're in-house, you're going to get one of these letters, or not just in-house, if you're an investment bank or at all working on a merger, you're going to get one of these letters from FINRA asking you to provide a lot of detailed information about who knew the information before the deal was announced so that they can track that against illegal, you know, suspicious trades and see if the fortuitous trades match some of your insiders. So as I mentioned, some of the cases that the SEC brings are indeed message cases where they're cherry picking a certain type of scenario in an effort to scare people. They're, they're supposed to act as a deterrent. And I would think they would even be more of a deterrent if the SEC hadn't stopped summarizing their cases back in 2014. Uh, these rolling summaries were a useful way to keep track of the types of cases that the SEC was bringing. But and I haven't seen anyone pick up where the SEC left off. That's why I found this void and had to make this video. So looking at the pattern of cases over the years, when the SEC charges someone within a company, they almost always are at an officer level or someone that sits on the board. There aren't many cases where they, they're chasing the rank and file. And as, noticed, as noted in this blog, the non-public information alleged in these cases continues to be unquestionably material information, material. So while not an aspect of the legal definition of materiality, the one day stock price movement caused by the information at issue in the SEC's 2019 cases averaged 47%, the price jump, although the variation in individual cases was extreme. So as always, many of the cases concerned mergers and acquisitions, but there are other types of cases too. So here's a nifty chart that breaks out the different topics that involved in material, not public information. Very useful. So let's dig in. One, directors. So over the years, there have been a number of cases brought against directors. This 2012 case is a class and garden variety tale of a director tipping his, his golf buddy. Yeah, directors and golf courses tend to go hand in hand in these cases. The case against famous golfer uh, Phil Mickelson back in 2016 started off with a tip shared from a director of Dean Foods that was shared on a golf course. 
Uh, this quote from a Matt Levine comma about the case made me laugh. Why would you insider trade with $74 million of your own money for one thing, buying a third of a stock's volume every day for three days is pretty noticeable, but also it is just so much money for a person. This points out how easy it is in some of these cases for regulator to notice what's going on. They wouldn't need an algorithm to assist them in detecting this time of this type of tomfoolery. Then there's this 2016 case that takes the cake for brazenness. A director who bought stock in a Target during a board committee meeting while the deal was being discussed. Then the director placed four more orders with the broker within an hour after the meeting ended. <laughs> Dumbass. Two CEOs. The SEC has brought quite a few cases against CEOs over the years, as you would expect. These understandably attract a lot of media attention. Normally, these cases involve the CEO selling their holdings before the rest of us find out that the company ain't doing so hot. So Enron CEO Jeff Scaling sold $60 million worth of that company's stock in 2001, just before the fraud was unveiled. Uh, Joe Nacho was CEO of a big company, Quest Communications, from if you, all, you remember that back in the days, that was lying to the street about his financial picture, and he sold $105 million worth of stock in the early 2000s before the truth came out. Then there's Countrywide's financial CEO, Angelo Mozilla, who's at the heart of the country's mortgage meltdown. He made $140 million before he got busted in 2008. And then former Inclone CEO, Sam Waxal, was busted for selling his company stock after finding out regulators had rejected his application for, for a new con cancer drug. Uh, these cases are pretty old. A few years ago, here's a more recent one, uh, Lions Fiber Optics, Product CEO used two broker accounts, held the names of his wife and his brother who lived in Taiwan to trade in his company's stock ahead of his company's earnings calls. He made some of these trades from his office in the company's headquarters. And then my favorite story from over the past year involves a Swedish company, Hexagon, where the CEO conducted an earnings call while two police officers, two cops were in the room. The police still let him do the earnings call. The audience was not told what was going on and then he was arrested for insider trading. Three, CFOs, controllers, and treasurers. So there are cases against those in the finance department since they inevitably have knowledge of pending deals or how the company's financial performance is shaping up before almost anyone else. As Quest was failing, it wasn't only the CEOs dumping the stock, the CFO did too. In 2007, the treasurer at Restoration Hardware tipped three friends, instructing them to limit the size of their purchases to prevent detection. And then there's this case from 2019, an example of someone lower down the food chain, an accountant at Illumina who tipped a friend ahead of four quarterly announcements in exchange for all expense paid travel and other expensive gifts. Four, chief information officers. The latest thing to be worried about is that folks in your IT department will get wind of cyber breaches before anyone else. Since these folks historically haven't had access to non-public information, they're not as attuned to the insider trading laws as others that are regularly subject to the blackout periods. So this case against an Equifax employee who was about to be named the CIO made quite a splash a few years ago. The guy threw his career and reputation away for a hundred grand. He literally had just been offered the CIO position, a wife and two young kids. Very sad. Five, other managers. The SEC does go other after Five, other managers. The SEC does go after other officers. This one from 2017 involved a senior VP who was also the senior credit officer for a bank that had conducted a diligence review of a Target's loan portfolio. The dude slid a napkin to his pal at a bar with the name of a company that was about to be acquired. You, you can't make this stuff up. It's cloak and dagger, baby. Shoving that napkin. <laughs> oh, God. Uh Another example is the vice president of sales of Life Fitness who tipped a friend in 2015 who then tipped other friends and who then proceeded to buy a bunch of call options where nine people were charged in total. So you have all that tipper type, tippy liability stuff going on. Six, rank and file. Although rare, there are occasional cases brought against low level employees. So in 2010, the SEC brought a case against two railroad employees who had seen people in suits tour the railroad the rail yards overheard co-workers discussing the possible sale of the company and then were asked to prepare asset valuations. Seven, the lawyers. Of course, the worst of these cases is when the in-house lawyers themselves are caught. 
In 2015, the in-house lawyer at Apple, the guy responsible for enforcing the company's insider trading policy, caught. <laughs> he traded ahead of three straight earnings calls. In one of those instances, he sold $10 million in Apple stock, virtually all of his holdings, over a four-day period before a negative earnings announcement. Yeah, that doesn't look suspicious. <laughs> However, his pattern of doing this kind of thing dated back years to 2011, so I can see why he grew bolder over time. Around the same time that the SEC brought that Apple case, it charged an associate general counsel at SeaWorld. That guy bought SeaWorld stock just ahead of a positive quarterly earnings release. He made 65 grand and lost his career. Don't do it. Don't insider trade. Don't tip. Eight, be careful with your friends. One of the craziest cases in recent memory involved a snooping house guest, a, law, a lifelong friend of the general counsel at its Sintas Corporation. The, the GC took home a folder labeled with the code name for a prospective deal, and a friend was at the GC's, GC's house to play a charity golf tournament and went into the den to change into his golf shoes. And he saw that folder. He saw the merger documents on the desk and read them, not telling his friend that he had that he did that. So then he bought stock and he persuaded his dad and girlfriend to do the same. All told, they made a quarter mil. The GC was not charged, but the friend and the others that the friend got involved, of course, were busted in 2019. And then let me turn you on to this other case involving um, Amazon's purchase of Whole Foods. The SEC brought this case in 2019 also. Someone working on the deal told his wife that he couldn't travel to attend a family member's medical procedure. Then the wife told a family member that her spouse was working on the then unannounced deal. And then that family member, a 78-year-old man, he ran out and bought call options in, on Whole Foods within the hour. He made $27,000 on this. So by virtue of the history pattern and practice of sharing confidence, his wife owed a duty of trust or confidence to family member A, and family member A expected that wife would maintain the confidentiality of the material not public information. So this... <laughs> This is how easy it is to get caught. Don't do it. Mm -hmm.